This is a production of Cornell University. I'm here to tell you today about our ash seed collection workshop. Um, so we started this effort um, actually three years ago. We were funded, um, got a three-year grant from the Northeastern Area State and Private Forestry Association. And essentially we were tasked with doing five workshops in New York State each of the three years to educate people on um, you know, the fact that we're losing our ash species across the state and now across much of the East. Um, and in addition to these workshops, we um, were tasked with making 150 collections over the course of the three years of the three most common uh, ash species that we have here in the state. So here on the right-hand side of the slide, you have the Latin, uh, Fraxinus is the genus for ash. So we have Americana, which is the white ash, Pennsylvanica, which is the green ash, and Nigra, which is the black ash. Um, so just a little bit about um, the nationwide collection program, because this program, you know, it extends beyond our efforts here um, in New York State. Um, as I said, it's a U.S. Forest Service effort, so there's collections happening, you know, all over. Um, you know, from Ohio down into the southeast um, in Massachusetts. Um, it's a really big, um, almost nationwide effort that we're a part of, which is pretty exciting. And the general gist of it is that we want to collect these seeds to preserve the genetic diversity of, um, of ash. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, in a second, but um, in essence, we're losing these species to an invasive insect, emerald ash borer, which I'm sure the majority of you have heard about by now. Um, so these seeds will be stored um, long-term, up to 50 years, um, in a U.S. Forest Service seed bank down in Georgia. Um, and, you know, so that way researchers and breeders will be able to look at the genetics of these trees and see if they can't you know, breed a more resistant species or, you know, look a little more about why some trees are more resistant than others. Um, and not only that, you know, the potential for these seeds to be used um, in future restoration efforts once we have um, the problem of emerald ash borer under control. Um, fingers crossed that we do one day. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about emerald ash borer, um, as I said, I assume if you're citizen of New York State, you have an infestation somewhere near you. Um, here in the Catskills, we're unfortunately home to the largest, one of the largest now and fastest growing infestations in the state. Um, so emerald ash borer is a little teeny tiny beautiful insect which is native to Asia. Um, it arrived here in the states a long time ago, um, probably in Detroit first and it came in and packing material um, for car parts. So it, you know, came into those, those car factories that Detroit was famous for um, and started infesting trees in Michigan and you know, pathologists were really scratching their heads over it because trees start to show symptoms of infestation before um, the bug is actually visible. So, you know, they'll start dropping leaves, their canopy will thin, they'll just you know, look off, and they have this thing called epicormic sprouting, which is when leaves actually come out of, you know, the trunk itself or the base of the tree, and it's just a sign of, of stress that they're, um, the tissues that they use for transporting nutrients and water are being compromised. Um, so it was discovered in Michigan in 2002, and it came to New York in 2009. And now it's in over 24 states and at least two Canadian provinces, um, probably more than that. It's incredibly fast moving and hard to track because it, um, it will be transported in infested material like logs and ash is a very popular, um, useful timber. Um, the green, black, and white species of ash that I mentioned before are very susceptible. Um, and unfortunately, we're expecting nearly 100% mortality in forests, um, in ash forests across the state. 
And you can see that it happens really fast if you live near one of these epicenters. Um, as I said, where I live in the Catskills, it arrived first in Woodstock um, around 2009, probably a little earlier it came. And um, already we have over 95% mortality um, in, in those areas. I mean, Asher are dead and have fallen and, you know, it's the game is over. So we're looking at functional extirpation of this species. Um, this is a huge blow to not only the ecology that these trees are a part of, but you know, also economically, as I said, it's a very important timber species. So to take a little look at you know, why this matters so much, as I said, you can see on the left that map um, is it's a distribution of ash by county. So it's kind of like the density of ash in each county. So you can see up by Ontario, there is a ton of ash. I mean, that's like 30% ash in those forests there. So this is a huge, huge blow to lose those trees. Um, but it's a very common tree species throughout the state. Um, they have somewhere around 7% of our forests are ash. And there on the right is um, a map from last year that looks at sort of um, the core areas of uh, where these EAB infestations have gotten started and how they're spreading. So the black is like, you know, the trees are dead and dying, and the red is how it's sort of spreading out from there. Um, and to see more updated maps of these, they update them, you know, maybe once or twice a year. You can look that up on the Department of Environmental Conservation website. So this is just a closer look at some of the biggest and fastest moving um, infestations in our state. A lot of um, urban and suburban infestations. Ash is a very popular street tree because it's, um, you know, super hardy and tolerant to pollution and compaction and things like that. So, you know, a lot of these streets have um, ash trees that are going to be falling on houses and cars and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty serious problem across, you know, many uh, sort of spheres. Um, and one of the ways that the state has been trying to deal with this problem is by setting up quarantines. Um, this particular strategy was enacted last year, I think it was maybe last May or somewhere around there. Um, so there's little you know, you see drawn stations and they're trying to limit or regulate um, the infested materials that are moving in and out of those areas because, as I said, it's really um, very hard to treat the station is going to pop up because timber or firewood is around all the time. If you don't burn a piece of firewood or, you know, you're transporting timber during flight season, one of these little larvae can metamorphose and just fly out of that infested wood. Um, as you're driving along. Um, and so that's why we have these rules about don't move firewood more than 50 miles uh, crow flies in New York State because this is how these forest pests get, get transported. So, you know, some of the other ways to deal with it other than quarantines um, are removing the trees and replacing them with something that isn't ash. Um, be great. And some native, a lot of these, um, these ash are native, but um, they come from sort of Midwestern stock. Um, so we, you know, we like to think about genetically local um, seed stock, you know, makes things kind of more accustomed to the vagaries of our particular climate and stuff like that. Um, you can use insecticides. Um, insecticides do work ash trees, um, so long as they're not, you know, super infested. Um, However, it's expensive. You know, if you have a beautiful specimen tree or a great seed producer or something hanging over your house, you know, by all means, that's a great option to treat it. Um, but again, you're going to treat it for expensive. Oak uh, trolls, native like woodpecker, non-native. Um, there are a few species of wasps that are released right now that are pretty effective parasitoids. Um, you know, however, they do target some of our native ash borers. Um, and by the way, our native ash borer is not a, not a problem. The emerald ash borer is um, our ash trees are adapted and evolved to deal with our native ash borer. And then there's seed collection as a great management option. I'll tell you a little more about that. Um, 
why we like seed collection so much. You know, outside of actual habitat. Um, so if we can't stop EAB, we can take their seeds and bank them and ensure that those trees have a chance of survival later on in the future. Um, it's fast and it's inexpensive, which is huge. Like I said, you know, cutting down trees and treating with insecticides, very expensive. Seed collection, very, you know, comparably cheap. Um, and you can do it for a long time and anyone can do it which is why we are having this webinar, because we would love for you guys to help. Um, so as I said, this grant has been going on for three years. Last year we had a huge season. So ash is a masting species like oaks, for example, which means that they tend to have sort of a mass, massive seed production year. Uh, so this is kind of you know, to overwhelm seed predators and stuff like that. You just put all of your seeds into one year and that way you make sure that at least some of them survive seed predators. Um, so we collected like crazy last fall. We had a ton of volunteers who were involved in scouting for us. Um, it was about 75, 80 people who were scouting for us. And then we had 60 folks who were actually making collections just all across New York State. Um, and we sort of New York State uh, is divided into eight, these eight um, uh, eco-regions. So that's how we make sure that we're kind of um, getting a lot of diversity of different trees growing in different habitats across the state. So these are, you know, evenly dispersed more or less across the state. Um, and we made 220 collections last year, which was, was way above 150 um, collections for the actual grant that we're you know, obligated to do. Um, we had tons and tons of white ash. Um, you know, that's a very easy species to find. Uh, we had a good amount of green, uh, it's a little harder to find. And then we had not too much black, um, and I'll talk more about later, um, Mr. Grove areas where people don't, you know, go very often. So I didn't get too many collections of those. Oh. Hold on a second. Here we go. Um, so we were thinking, you know, wow, we've exceeded this goal so much. We've got 223 collections. What can we do this year since it's probably not going to be another mass year? These trees have really exhausted themselves by this huge bumper crop year in 2015. So what we did is we thought about, um, you know, species that are associated with ash. So what are the species that are going to suffer as well, once the trees um, that dominate the canopy die, um, and how can we preserve their genetics, their diversity? So we came up with a list um, of species that um, were, well, as I said, were associated with these ash forests. And we did this primarily by looking at the New York Natural Heritage Program's um, data on ash forests. And then we took out any rare species, um, any species that uh, has orthodox seed, which means that um, you can't preserve it for more than a more than a year. It has a really high moisture or, or oil content. And we came up with 22 species. Um, and I was hoping that today we could go through some of these because they're you know they're all relatively common. Um, but I mean we don't only have an hour for this webinar. So what I'm going to say is, if you have an interest in plants. Um, and you think you would like to do some collections of these associated species, then get in touch with me um, and we can go through some of the ones, you know, you could pick five or, or ten um, to kind of get really, really good at identifying and then um, could collect those seeds and contribute to our seed bank. Um, all of these plants are, um, they produce seed, seed in the fall, so I've just started collecting some of them now. Um, it's a little bit challenge, challenging because you have to collect from um, a large population, so over 50 plants. Um, but it's really fun. It's a great way to improve your plant ID. And like I said, it's, it's part of this really um, big growing network of, of seed collectors working to conserve native plants. So it's important work. Um, and we were going to focus on these associated species this year, but then all of a sudden we started getting reports that Lo and behold, 
some ash were actually still producing seeds. So since that's sort of the focus of our grant, we um, we're going to continue uh, hammering on Fraxinus and trying to get more collections of ash seed, particularly the green and the black ash. Um, so we need your help. Um, so what I am going to do then is go through, if I can advance this slide, is go through um, the identification of these three different common species of ash that we have in New York State and what our seed collection protocol is in, in the hopes that some of you might be able to help us out. Um, so this is a white ash, um, Fraxinus sericana, and I would say this is, you know, one of the easier, this is the easiest ash to identify, not only because it's very common and abundant, um, but because it just sort of, well, maybe I've been looking at too much ash, but I think it just sort of jumps out at you. Uh, you often see it along roadsides and in old fields. It's more of an upland species. Um, you know, it inhabits drier soils than the other two species that we'll we'll talk about. Um, but characteristic of the ash is it has what what we what we know as opposite leaves. So the leaves actually come off of the main stem um, opposite one another, and there aren't you know, too, too many other tree species that are going to do that. Um, you know, the maples do that. Um, box elder does that. That's actually a maple. But you want to make sure the first thing that you're looking for is those opposite, opposite leaves and opposite branches. And that's a picture of a white ash there. Um, and white ash has these sort of broader leaflets. So the, those two things that you're looking at there, th that's an entire leaf. Um, the little leaves coming off are, are known as leaflets. Uh, I wish I had a pointer. Um, so white ash has these sort of more rounded, chunkier, wider leaflets, uh, whereas green, green ash has more lanceolate, thinner um, leaflets. So that's a really good identifying feature. Also, white ash has pale undersides. So you could think white ash white undersides or white ash wide leaflets. And then green ash is green, green all over. Green ash also has this kind of glossy sheen to it, I find, um, a little glossier than the other two. And then here is a black ash leaf, which, like I said, it, black ash is more difficult to find because it likes, you know, sort of wetlands or it grows a lot in the Hudson around here in the sort of the tidal swamp area. So it's not like a white ash or a green ash where you're driving along and you're like, oh, hey, there's an, there's an ash. It's kind of rare that you would be able to see a black ash that way. Um, so again, in these pictures here, the whole thing that you're looking at is a leaf and those little leaves coming off, those are leaflets. So with black ash, the leaflets are sessile, which means that they just sort of sit right on that central stem. They don't have a little teeny stem coming off that connects them to that central stem. That central stem is called a rachis. I'm trying not to, to do too much um, botanical terminology. So those leaflets are just sitting right there on the stem. And um, I think another, another good way to determine black ash is it also has this kind of almost flaky bark in comparison to the other two, which have quite regular grooved, uh, some people say diamond-shaped bark. Um, And then there are other ways which I don't I don't find as helpful uh, to determine the species. You can see the black ash twig on the left has a sort of fatter terminal blood uh, bud. Some people call that an ice cream cone terminal bud, as opposed to the green ash has smaller terminal bud. Um, then you can also look at uh, what we call leaf scars. So if you pull off a leaf from a stem, that little sort of you know, looks kind of like the shape of a smiling mouth uh, where you pulled the leaf off. That's the leaf scar. Um, so, you know, a lot of characteristics on these ash can be variable, and they can actually often look like they're sort of somewhere in between two species. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, with white ash, uh, often the, the leaf scar looks like this crescent moon. Um, so I know someone who reminds herself of that by saying white ash, white moon. So remembering the shape of that leaf scar. 
Uh, the seeds are another great way to distinguish between species, um, and you would be looking at seeds a lot. Um, when you get really good, you can determine them, you know, as you're driving by at 60 miles per hour. <laughs> the, um, the green ash are in these, like, really tight, sort of chunky panicles. So the whole aggregation there is called a panicle. Uh, and green ash is that picture on the left. See how it's just really, you know, a big, chunky clump of seeds. And those seeds are, are, are narrower as well um, and more, I guess, tapered than the white ash. And then the white ash, the picture on the right, are much looser, much sparser panicles. And then looking at the seeds themselves up close, um, you can see the differences between the, the green ash and the white ash, the green being much narrower and sort of more elongate, and the white ash with that broader base. And then the black ash is totally different. It, it's sort of almost oval-shaped. Um, and the black ash, well, I'll get into this later, actually, getting ahead of myself here. Um, so let's re just to quickly review the identification of those species. You remember, you want to straight away look for the opposite branching. Um, and ash has these, what we know as compound leaves, so I said, you know, the, that whole structure was a leaf and the little things coming off of it are leaflets. So that's a compound leaf. So opposite branching, compound leaves. And then, you know, make sure you're looking at multiple characteristics. So you can look at the leaf scar or the buds, look at the seeds. And I think that the habitat, um, you know, the location where you're going to find the species is really helpful too. So as I said, white ash is usually more of an upland species. Um, it can be found in an area that gets, you know, sort of uh, with higher water table and then you'll see white ash will uh, start to, you know, it's called ash yellows, so will start to get a little stressed because it likes uh, some drier soils. Green ash is kind of in the middle, it, it, you know, and the soil can be moist, it can be dry, um, and then black ash um, really likes wet, wet areas, likes wet feet. So it's kind of a spectrum that you have there. Okay, so moving on to our collection strategy and protocol. Sorry, I'm having trouble with this clicker. There we go. Um, okay. So this is just kind of a, an overview of what we're going to talk about. So we've identified the species. Um, you're going to want to locate and monitor some good seed trees. You know, these could be anywhere in your local park or um, your backyard, um, your front yard, along the street. You just want to make sure that it's not a planted tree. Um, a good way to determine that is, you know, you, first of all, you identify that it's one of the native species. It's not an Asian ash. Um, and it's not planted in a row. You know, sometimes you'll see uh, an ash tree planted out in the middle um, of sort of a a really neatly um, maintained lawn in a park or something like that it might be questionable whether that's planted or not. Sometimes you can talk to park staff to confirm that. Um, but, you know, we don't want to be collecting the seeds and preserving the genetics of these trees that have, you know, questionable origins. You know, we don't know where they come from. We want to be collecting the seeds that we know are native New Yorkers, um, you know, because we care about our New York natives. Um, then I'm going to teach you how to check for seed maturity because it's important to collect seed at the right time. Um, make sure they're not too insect damaged. Tell you how to show, um, fill out the data sheet, how to pick seeds, and how to handle them when you're done. I mentioned before our sort of general strategy for this grant and this three-year program um, was to make 150 collections, and those collections. Um, are divided, supposed to be divided evenly between those three common species. So 50 collections of green, 50 of white, and 50 of black. And we exceed those collections. We got 223. However, we got, you know, something like 150 white, um, 60 green, and then the remainder were black. And as I said, that's sort of based upon ease of, of, of finding, uh, since the white is so easy to observe. Um, and we're trying to get these um, trees sort of 
spread more or less evenly across these ecoregions that I mentioned before. So you can see the map on the right is a sort of um, finer gray map of some of the ecoregions across New York State. These regions are based on things like, you know, climate and soil type and, you know, how much it rains, um, things like this. Um, and again, that's just to make sure we're capturing the most genetic diversity possible in these collections. So our protocol generally, um, you know, we're looking for naturally occurring trees, as I said, and you want to make sure your trees are 100 to 300 feet apart, so 100 foot minimum between your trees. You know, if you find three trees and sort of in a cluster and they all look great, just make sure they're not super close because, you know, it's possible you could be um, collecting from two trees that are, you know, connected on the ground or something like that. We want to make sure that they're genetically uh, as different and diverse as possible. Um, you're going to make one collection per tree. So not multiple collections on one tree. If there's tons and tons of seed just all in one collection, if they seem to be maturing at different times, just all at one collection. Uh, then you're going to take a regular grocery bag, you know, just one of those paper bags, and it needs to be filled with at least two to three inches of seed. So it seems like a lot of seed, but generally if ash is producing seed, you'll have no problem filling it that high. And the paper bags are kind of neat, actually, because the first crease line is is pretty much where we want you to, you know, it's sort of the minimum fill line, if you will. And then you're going to need to fill up the sheet. Um, you're going to get a twig sample, and you're going to have to take a couple of photos. So it sort of sounds like a lot, but I promise you it's not. But first, you have to know when the seeds are ready to collect. So we're going to go through a few through a few images of that. Um, so an ash seed, the whole structure is called a samara or samara, and they're going to start maturing very soon. So some um, as early as mid-September we found last year, and they can really hang on the tree for a long time. So you know, into November we were collecting, even early December last year. And what you want to do is you'd want to look for a brown seed coat. So the seed is actually inside the samara. And Samara helps with dispersal with wind, um, so these seeds can fly away from their home tree and a good spot to root and germinate. Um, and the seeds that drop early, we often get a lot of questions about this, are often damaged. So don't worry about picking them up from the ground because those are natural abortions. Um, we want to be picking off of the tree starting around mid-September. The only exception to that is that black ash seeds don't actually mature on the tree, often they'll drop off. Um, so you can collect those from the ground. That's, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure you do these little checks, which I'm going to show you now, to make sure it's um, viable seed. So you can actually peel off the exterior of the Sarah, um, as is shown in these pictures. And if you can look closely on the picture on the right, it's actually revealing um, the seed inside that whole fruit, the samara structure, and you can see it has a brown seed coat. So that is key. That's what you're looking for, that pale brown seed coat. If you peel it open and you see that it's green or white or it's shriveled or it's not filling the whole cavity, then the seed is either bad or um, not yet mature too early. So you want a pale brown seed coat, and you want to make sure it's nice and plump and full. So here are some good pictures demonstrating that. You can see on the left that embryo is immature, pale green. Um, and then on the right, you can see um, a great-looking seed coming out of that um, samara, nice and full. And it's also firm. Uh, so if it seems a little floppy, again, you're probably too early. It's a nice firm with a brown, pale brown seed coat. Um, if you don't have the fingernails to tear open the samurai, you can also use a razor blade, but they're pretty easy to get open. And uh, these are just some more cut tests that show you what it looks like um, inside that samara. So on the left there, you can see that this is really maybe half of its actual mature size, so not ready. And then there um, on the right, um, same thing. Uh, 
Um, here are some very good looking seeds, nice and full with those brown seed coats. And then you also want to look for insect damage because um, this is a major, major thing to look for. Um, weevils are a huge problem. Um, they love ash seeds. Um, and you don't want to collect a tree that's highly infested with weevils because, um, you know, that seed is not, is not viable. It's damaged. Um, so sometimes you can see that weevil damage on a, on a cut test, but you can also just see it on the exterior. So the left hand side, some fruits actually penetrated um, the, the fruit to lay an egg. And then if you open it up inside, this is pretty common. You can, you can see this. It's, it's kind of, you'll see there's a little larva inside who's munching away on that seed. So if you find an ash tree that has good fruit, you know, go around, pick some seeds off of each side of the tree and do an inspection. If it seems like most of the seeds are infested, then just forget it. You've got a, got a bad tree. Don't bother collecting from that. Um, you, want a, you want a tree where the majority of the fruits are, you know, nice and full and not infested. Okay, so we've identified the tree, found a good crop. The seeds are full and mature, not damaged. The next thing is to look at the data sheet. So this ash seed collection data sheet, I can either email it to you or you can find it online at www.marsb.org. Um, looks a little scary, but I assure you it's very simple. Basic stuff like date of collection, what your name is, what species you're collecting from, where you are, what the topography is. The most important thing um, is to fill out that little black box in the top right-hand corner, which asks for your collector's ID number and your seed lot number. This is how we're going to link you and your seed to the actual, and this data to the actual collection of seeds that you make. Um, so your collector's ID number is your last name. So my last name is Marquand. And then the number um, collection that you've made. So if you've made one collection, it would be Marquand 001. When I make my 100th collection, it'll be Marquand 100. So that's your ID number. And then the seed lot number, seed lot ID is MarsB. So that's, you know, just a way of showing that you are linked to our project. And this information also has to go on the paper bag that contains the seed, just as I said, to make sure the information on that data sheet is always linked to that seed. And if you're part of a group, you know, if you're, um, you're, you as master gardeners get together and you want to do something for your town, you can come up with a unique uh, collector's ID number. That's fine. And, and then it will be stored in the bank under your group name. And, um, you know, if it ever comes to the point where you'd like to use some of your seed for, uh, you know, restoration or whatever, you can query based upon that name. And there's a picture of the paper bag that has um, Clara, my coworker's last name, Holmes. It's her first collection, so it's 001. And then it's Mars B. That's part of the project that's, that she's working with. That's the seed lot. So in terms of picking the seeds, very easy, very straightforward. Just make sure they're mature. Pick them off of the panicle. You know, you don't need to put any other material in the bag because that could alter the moisture content of the bag. So just strip the seeds right off. Um, so you can also toss them into a tarp. Sometimes it, <laughs> I've had this experience where it's been really windy when you're collecting and you need something a little sturdier than a paper bag because it just flies away. You can put a tarp under the tree um, or have, you know, a heavier bucket or something, whatever works for you. So this is the minimum fill line that I was talking about. You can see that crease is right, right at three inches. So that's at what we need at least. If you want to fill the whole bag, go for it. Then you're also going to need a twig sample. And this is for identific identification purposes. We had a few um, specimens last year that it was just kind of like, oh, I don't know, is this green or is this white? ash. Um, so taking that twig sample, um, it's about six to nine inches long, just pull all the leaves off and chuck it in the bag with the seeds. Um, that can help with identification purposes and it's an important part of the collection. 
And then once the twig um, and the seeds have been collected, you want to label your bags. Um, just ignore these pictures. I don't know. Um, we want to make sure you have your last name and the number of the collection and then Mars B. Um, and fold them down and staple them. Make sure the seed doesn't explode everywhere. And then you're going to send them off to Midterm Seed Bank, which is in Staten Island. And we'll give you that information when your collection is ready. Um, and we go over all your data before we actually send them to the seed bank, um, the Forest Service Seed Bank in Georgia. And you're also going to need two photos. Um, one is an up-close photo of the trunk of the tree, um, again, for identification purposes, showing your seed lot identification number on the bag. And then the other one is going to be the whole tree. And this is to kind of see the landscape that the tree is a part of. And those, those, it's easier to just email those photos to me. Uh, I like to do good copies, but you know, you don't have to go through that whole palaver if you don't want to. And once you've picked them, um, you know, just basic consent. Don't leave them in your car if it's a super hot day. You don't want the seeds to roast. Um, they want to be, you know, dry, dryish, but remain cool. Um, you know, sort of around 30% humidity. If that helps anyone. Um, you could put them in sort of a cool cupboard or maybe in your basement if it's dry. Um, after the seeds get shipped to the bank, they're um, kept in that nice sort of cool, um, sort of dryish uh, climate. Um, and they're chilled also to make sure if you missed any weevils um, that the, the weevils will come out and build, you know, stay in that collection of seeds. Um, I think I just went over that, yeah. Um, oh, and then, yeah, they're frozen at very, very, very cold temperatures. So this is how they're kept for up to 50 years, is because we essentially stop any metabolism that's happening and that seed comes to a halt, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And all of the information um, about your collections are recorded in this in your national information network that's called GRIN. Um, so you can actually, you know, look up your seed and see it there and all that information in the um, in that database. Um, so ways that you can help is um, again um, helping us find these these trees this fall. It's as I said, it's a pretty spotty um, seed production year, but we know that they're out there. We've gotten reports, particularly from the southern um, and around the Great Lakes. Um, so we're, we're you know we're trying to collect. Um, more green ash and more black ash in particular, but you know we'll take whatever so long as it's a naturally occurring tree. Um, if you're interested in collecting other species, um, the associated species, please do reach out to me. Um, um, I would be happy to, as I said, go through and sort of make a smaller list of species that you could focus on um, if you felt like that was something you wanted to do. And my email is ash.marsb at gmail.com. So A S H dot M A R S B at gmail.com. Um, and then there's another project that we're also involved in um, with multiple partners. Um, we're still kind of coming up with um, an informational sort of outreach toolkit for it, um, but we're working with the New York Botanical Garden and the U.S. Arboretum, among others, um, to try and work on this question of ash phylogenetics. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot that's known about the distinction between species um, in the Fraxinus genus and the ash genus. And so this project is hoping to sort of take a finer uh, grade, closer look at where those distinctions may be. And this is going to be you know, really important for determining which species are more susceptible to emerald ash borer and how we can assure that we're, you know, conserving uh, this really important um, genus of trees. And for that project, we need citizen scientists to help us make collections of seed and herbarium specimens um, so that we can have um, samples for the herbarium, but also um, the DNA that we need to look at those phylogenetics. So. There's a number of different projects that we have on our plate. Um, we need a lot of help, um, but I think it's you know a really fun way to be involved in 
native plant conservation and a really important cause. Do you need more than one ash tree to participate, or is one okay? Yeah, one is all you need. Can you collect from a tree that's already infected by the emerald ash borer? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes if you have a really badly infested tree, um, it'll put out what's called a stress crop. So it's just kind of like, oh, I'm dying. I better make a last-ditch effort to get my, my genes out there. Um, and it'll try really hard, but those seeds will be kind of shriveled and empty. So if you see that your tree is infested and it has seeds, just make sure you do that viability check. Uh, if they look great, we'll take them. Are there areas in the state that you are most interested in having seeds from? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yes, we, we didn't get that much seed from the Adirondacks last year, but from what I hear from scouts, um, there's not really much going on there. Um, so that's one area that we, we missed a little bit last year. Um, but this year we're trying to focus on lakes region, and we're hoping that because it does have such a heavy, heavy um, density of ash in the canopy that we'll be able to find something. So, you know, all sort of along like Buffalo and Rochester along those, that lake shore um, would be great. But anywhere, honestly, anywhere. <laughs> all right. Well, if um, we don't have any other questions coming in, either let me thank you again for joining us and thank Molly for, for sharing that information with us. And a good luck in the months ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Laurie, and thanks everyone for tuning in. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.